giving us there. And so he won't be on next Monday at 1.30. He will be on next Tuesday at 1.30, and then he'll just be going great guns on what he saw and all this during the media session. However, one of our things, I've got my ballot. i got to return it by 3 o'clock on who is going to win the Southern Conference in football this year. And, uh, well, SoCon John Hooper is there, and he's been writing a lot about it, too. And as I told him yesterday when we were talking privately, I just don't know if any team in the Southern Conference has a fiddler's chance in hell of winning it. Mathematically, somebody's got to, but I just, there's a glaring weakness on seemingly every team. But first, congratulations in order to SoCon John Hooper. He picked up a new job. He's no longer contributing to Medium. No, 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 no. Hero Sports is what you're covering SoCon football for. Uh, we've had the people on at Hero on this show uh, from time to time. They do a very good job covering the FCS. Tell us a little bit about your new role with uh, Hero Sports. Yeah, it's going to be um, one of my jobs at Media Day next week. We'll be going around and trying to get some feature stories on uh, players at each, you know, school uh, to kind of write about each throughout the season. And, you know, I've already touched base with, you know, Mercer's SID and, and you know, gotten us some ideas from, from a couple of SIDs so far on, like, what would be some feature type stuff that I could do on your team and um, what are some, you know, some of the players that I could write about and, and are there any interesting stories. So I've gotten some good feedback on that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I think the, you know, the one cool thing about covering FCS football in the Southern Conference is there's never any shortage of um, both communication, usually from the, the uh, sports information departments, because they want to be covered, and they're not having to deal with, you know, 150 other outlets covering the same thing. So um, that makes it kind of neat for me, and it. And it it kind of makes it neat to, to cover the student athletes who probably that they well I'll say they don't give it enough coverage uh, for what they do for SCS football and, and for the, what they do as student athletes and I, I think that's um, that's something that I enjoy doing and I enjoy giving them the coverage that they deserve. I've always enjoyed the Southern Conference, be it in football, be it in basketball, be it in baseball. I mean, it's uh, I, I have always enjoyed it, and I've always demanded that it uh, be covered, to tell you the truth. And like I said, in the Tri-Cities, I mean, we're now market 102 and falling, okay, in terms of TV markets, out of 210. So we're barely in the upper half. Used to be the same size as Vegas, okay, so we're not going the right way. But, uh, you know, Vegas got bigger... Uh, because Oscar Goodman said, as cosmopolitan as Vegas was, we need pro sports. That was one of the things that he really pushed on for the growth of his town. Uh, I will push and say, look, ETSU, I mean, they're the big league team in town. We can debate whether or not it's practical or not for ETSU to win a national championship in, say, basketball or baseball. We can debate if that's feasible or not, but uh, they get invited to the party and those are two titles that the rest of the nation cares about. To me, that's big league. That's not uh, a high school title that only the state will care about. That's the right. way that I've always uh, looked at that and such. And, and certainly no one, I mean, it's D1. No one would deny that uh, Tennessee or Clemson or someone like that is uh, is big league. Uh let me. Uh, that there is one st uh, team that you think might be getting more big league. Let's look ahead to basketball season. You've written about. You're still contributing to MidMajorMadness.com, uh, and you recently wrote that you thought that Western Carolina would be the sleeper in the SoCon basketball season. Okay, it's the Air Conditioner League. Why do you think that the Catamounts could have a winning record this year? Well, I thought last year. Um they had a number of games that they were, you know, competitive in, especially in the Southern Conference. Um, I, I know they played, they came back on a, it, it's still a Power 5 conference team, but what we would call a bad way for us to um, and, But they played really well. I, I think that they have the pieces. I think they had a guy in Matt Halverson playing a, a little bit out of position last year. I think he's a, a local kid right around the East Tennessee area. Um, but he's a kid that, that was playing maybe the point guard position and, and really is a two guard. So um, they'll have the luxury of having a guy, Mason Faulkner, this year who transferred in from Northern Kentucky, and he'll be the point guard. So that will allow Halverson to move back into his more natural position. And I think that the, the recruiting class they brought in um, with some of the guys that they, they got, you know, I, I think that it was one of their better classes the league. Um, you, you look at um, a guy like Nicholas Ebdomoff, who, you know, he's got pretty good pedigree. Obviously, his 
father played at North Carolina. And, and then he had the chance to play, I guess, at the European Championships with France's under-19 team, uh, I guess, this past summer. So um, a guy that, you know, is 6'7", he's got pretty good size, and then they've got uh, a couple other uh, big men coming in. And Xavier Cork is a, is a guy from Texas that, that comes in. You know, he's kind of a change of pace player, according to Coach Frosser, that uh, he's, he's a little bit different, a more above-the-rim player than maybe from a Carlos Dotson um, that we saw last year. He's more physical and, and, a, and a guy that can wear you down in the paint. So um, they got a little bit of length to him this year. I think that's what makes him different. Uh, Tyler Harris is another the kid that's really young. I, I don't think – I think Coach Frosser said he wasn't going to turn 18 until August. So a really young kid, but I think uh, the future is bright for them as far as, you know, what they've added and, and, and what Prosser, or Coach Frosser was saying, that the kind of kid they're adding is, is more of a, a kid that's an athletic uh, guy that's not really have a position, but, you know, highly skilled um, and, and can play a, a number of different positions when called upon to do so. You know, and that – that allows, you know, you know, reading into what he was saying is that that kind of allows a, a guy to not feel like he's pressured and he's got two or three fouls on him. You know, they can they're interchangeable parts, so it's not like a, a, a guy's you know got to worry about uh, staying in the game or whatever. Um, that, that they can kind of interchangeably bring in guys that will will um, they'll be okay with. And you hear the term positionless basketball, which is hmm. um, I've heard from a number of different coaches that I've talked to over the offseason um, from the mid-major ranks. And they're trying to get kids now that are long, athletic, and skilled. So that, Now, that could be a trend right there. I mean, you mentioned all the scoring returning. You like their recruiting class. But uh, talking about Western Carolina and a positionless team, and I do think that's where basketball is going, yes, it kind of stands in contrast with Steve Forbes saying, you know, we've got to have a real good center. You've got to have a center to win in tournament play and all, you know. that's uh, So two different styles of thought. Virginia, remember, they were out there on the court during the national title game last year with five guards at one point. So there you yeah, go. I think so. That was uh, another thing Coach Prosser pointed out is that, you know, you've got teams that, that play like us in our league that they're pretty much uh, positionless. And then you've got really big teams like uh, that that are tougher to match up with because, you know, I look at, and this is not something he said, but um, this is something that I would apply to that, I think. But what he said is, you know, you look at the, the teams that are um, – I use like a, a Wichita State for example. Mm-hmm. The, the Midwestern teams—they're all—they always have kids that are big and that are really, you know, pretty skilled, and um, and they provide a unique challenge. I think TSU is kind of a, a different from what he was talking about. They're—they're they're more, you know, they're bigger. They, they've got guys that are skilled, and and they they challenge you in a lot of different ways. From where you know there's a majority of teams in SoCon are positionless basketball. You look at VMI, you look at uh, Furman, even I, I think it is that way, and I, I think Wofford to a certain extent. Is. And, and um, I think that if when you get to an ATSU, they're different, and that they're more like a, a team that you don't see in the SoCon very often, like the Wichita State or someone like that, or you know, in the Midwest, and maybe um, I. I Kansas has had a certain amount of great big men over the, the few years, you know, over their history, really. And I think back to guys like Ray Friend, um was one of the, the better big men that I saw play there. But, um, yeah, I think that it's more of a – I think what ETSU brings to the hey, table. I, I got 15 seconds here, so can you hold what ETSU brings to the yeah. table? We'll go to the commercial break. We'll hear from Asian House right now. And then we'll be back, and I'm going to have to pick my football ballot here with SoCon John Hooper's help. <laughs> 